Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Gordon Ritchie. My pronouns are he, him. Karen Mills and I will be your service leaders this morning, and we will also be the co-conductors of our church choir, Corialis. It's wonderful to have you with us. Karen has created a beautiful service for you to enjoy here in the sanctuary and online. Our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison, is technically off today. But you will, yes, you will notice, you will notice her singing in the choir. So there you go. Uh, we're going to start off with some announcements. I'm going to ask Karen to come forward. Good morning, everyone. My name's Karen Belita. My pronouns are she, hers. Um, the Dragging Youth series, which is an all-age drag show that the Unitarian Church of Edmonton sponsors, is held here. I have tickets for the next show in November, which is a unique show. It actually has a full catered Ukrainian dinner. Uh, I have tickets for it. They're $30. It's on a Saturday. What number of it is it's middle of middle of November if you are interested I know the date it's in my phone back there but the tickets are $30 it is a Ukrainian dinner it's supposed to be very similar to a Christmas dinner um, and it's a great cause to support so if anyone's interested please let me know thanks Karen we are one of two Unitarian Universalist congregations in Edmonton and as Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs and actions, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawing from many sources. Whatever you believe, whoever you love, how you identify, understand family, however you identify, whatever your age, race, or ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us on a journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any of those who are visiting with us this morning. Please join us for coffee and conversation following the service. We begin our time together acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, language, cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continue to enrich our vibrant community. Our community extends beyond this Sunday morning gathering. We have a monthly newsletter, and yes, I did read about the dragging youth in Ukrainian dinner on Friday's e-blast that came out. Uh, you're welcome to join us virtually on Facebook and Twitter, I will be able to keep up to date with all the activities that are going on, not only with our community, but our extended community. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us let go, just for a time, of the everyday world. We'll quiet ourselves, our phones and electronic devices that you may have with you this morning. Thank you. And we'll create a safe space this hour to simply be together. In the spirit of life and love, we gather. I would like to invite Yvonne to come forward for our opening words. The heart of our faith. What is it that calls you here, that calls you onward, that calls you inward, that leads you homeward? What is it that gives you the power to make that change, to ask that question, to take that journey? What is it? It says, you have done well, or asks you to learn more, that brings you to stillness, that holds you up in hard times. It is relationship, 
the beating heart of our faith. It begins when we share this hour, our truths, this air, our hearts. Come, let us worship together. I'm Karen Mills. I have the pleasure of co-directing the choir and co-leading the service this morning. I'm going to ask Allie Hammington to come forward and light our chalice. And as she's doing that, I'd invite you, if you're sitting with both of your feet on the ground, uh, whichever foot you have forward, just switch it. Bring it backwards and hold it that way for the length of the chalice lighting. We light our chalice today knowing that our hope and our passion are needed to change the world. We bring different gifts to the work, but we come together in one faith that what we do makes a difference both to our world and in ourselves.
I'd invite you now to join me in singing hymn number 124, Be That Guide. Uh, it can either be in your hymnal or the words will be projected on the back wall. 124, and please stand if that's comfortable for you. for you this morning. I love stories and I don't think it matters how old or young we are. Stories are always good. They're always a great way of sharing information. So I have two small candles with me and I have them this morning because I want to celebrate our fourth principle which is the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And uh, I think that's one of the absolutely fundamental and, and really unique parts of our faith as Unitarian Universalists in that we, we always have that power and responsibility to question. And so they're pretty big principles though. So let's just talk them, about them a little bit. So in UU faith, what, what does a free search, what does freedom to search mean for you? Just shout out. Say it again. Do your own thing. Choice. Start your own path. Google. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Barrier free. Okay. All right, so I'm going to light this first candle for freedom. Maybe I am. Freedom's obviously a tough concept. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, now I have the second candle for truth. So in a Unitarian Universalist sense, what does truth mean to you? Accountability, facing reality, pure motivation, pure motivation. wow, loving who, you are. loving who you are, lots of big concepts. So I'm going to light the second candle, actually the second candle kind of looks delicious. <laughs> mm. What did you think I just did? 
I ate a candle. How many of you thought I ate a candle? How many of you believed at the start of the story that I had two candles? How many of you have changed your mind? <laughs> it's actually white chocolate. It's really good. I was really looking forward to this story. <laughs> well, there's half of that one left. So one of the things that I really love about being Unitarian Universalist is that we do get to change our minds. And so when we discover new truths, new facts, new ways of looking at things, we can change our beliefs and change what we think. And in fact, not just we can, but we have a responsibility to. That we need to keep our minds open. That we need to always be questioning. And so we have tons of examples in our Unitarian and Universalist histories of people who have questioned the truth and changed their beliefs, changed others' beliefs, and changed the world because of it. And so, as we go into this week and learn new things, you might want to pause and ask yourself, is that really true? How do I know? Do I need to change my thinking? Do I need to change how I act? And if you can do both of those things, you might also want to offer some gratitude. And that's our story for today. We're now going to take a moment as we talk about sharing gratitude to also share our abundance. And this is something that we do every week. We are a self-sustaining faith and a self-sustaining congregation. But each week, half of the unidentified contributions, so the loose cash that goes into the contributions, either into the uh, collection plates here or that people choose to donate via online if you're watching us from uh, remote locations, goes to a different charity. And this month, we are going to what used to be called the CBC Turkey Drive. Um, and it's still a turkey drive. So we're still raising money for turkeys, or more importantly, the people who will consume those turkeys. And so, before we do that, <gasps> yes, do this. yes, you are. And before we do that, <laughs> Jan also has something very important that she wants to say. So we're going to listen to Jan. The choir's going to sing a song, and while we sing that song, the collection will be taken, and then we'll follow that with From You I Receive. Good morning. My name is Jan McMillan, and I'm one of three trustees of our Church Endowment Committee. Our chair is Ruth Marriott, and Marg Roach is our committee's voice of experience. We have declared November as the month to highlight our endowment fund. This is our church's emergency backup. It is recommended that these emergency funds be two to three times the annual operating budget of the church. And obviously, our fund is far short at $39,000. Normally, it grows three ways. One is the interest from the fund investments. Well, we all know how that's going these days. The second is donations in memory of a person at a celebration of life. I personally like to donate to this fund even when attending services for someone not connected to this church. The third way is to include a bequest in your will. I have specified an amount in my will, but hopefully this will not happen for a really long time. <laughs> So this month um, is a chance to give to our endowment fund a boost without having to die first. <laughs> we are inviting you, we are inviting you to make a special contribution during this November month of remembrance. Consider who has played a special part in the life of this church or in your life, past or present. I will make a donation to honor a special friend, Nancy Collins, who just loved to, opera, to sing in our choir. When we first moved into this church, we somehow managed to operate out of our tiny kitchen coffee area for quite a long time, or at least it seemed like a long time, through a very generous donation 
from Nancy, we were able to create our well-used and much appreciated kitchen, not only by us, but by many in our community. So we have brochures. Uh, the, uh, if you haven't picked one up, the ushers have some and envelopes to, that were created by our talented Andrew Mills for you to consider a special donation to boost our endowment fund. If you are willing, we would like to acknowledge your name and your honoree at a church service this month. Our church's theme this month is change. Well, let's change the amount in our endowment fund. Thank you. So, so these are special envelopes for the endowment fund. The other envelopes that are in the hymn books or that are at the back go to the general fund. These specifically, and you'll see they're highlighted, go to the endowment fund. So if anybody would like one of these, I'll just pass a few out. I'm very glad that we did not miss that announcement, and I also hope that your fund is not used for a long, long, long time. Before we sing, I'm going to invite you to just clasp your hands in your lap. Relax. And now have a look down. If your finger of your left hand is on top, just switch your hands so your other finger is on top. And hold that and see how that feels through the song. Thank you. 
going to invite John to do a reading, but before he does, if you're wearing a watch or a bracelet or a ring, can you switch it to your other hand? I'll just say I'm doing enough double tasking this morning. <laughs> I'm actually being sound tech while I'm singing. So in case you've noticed, I'm not actually looking at Google. Or playing video games. Or playing video games. So my name is John Pater. Uh, the reading I have is called Change is a Word on Wheels by Duro K. Farrar. Every Sunday morning, the church choir and I spend time in reflection and silence before we begin the first worship service. I often offer my thoughts on the day's theme or the state of the world, providing context to the message we bring. On a recent Sunday, I said to the choir, so often we make the mistake of living according to our hopes instead of according to our realities. I didn't mean to say it, and I didn't know that I would, but as I did, the statement became immediately true. I wonder if, in our efforts to be the change we wish to see in the world, we stop short at our ideal selves, the idea of ourselves we are most comfortable with. I wonder how often I think I've already been the change, and I'm waiting idly for the tendencies of the world to catch up. I'm unsettled by how frequently I'm surprised by my own social idiocy. How many times need I screw up the same person's pronouns or note that I am not surprised that the person who just nearly ran me off the road is of a certain race and or age, or make immediate assumptions about someone because of what I perceive to be their class. Or maybe this is a better question. How many times do I need to make mistakes at the expense of other people or people's groups before I am ready to admit that I'm not any better at this than the bigoted and willfully ignorant? I am liberal, often painfully so. I am not enlightened, I am not elevated, I am not better, but I believe with everything I am that I can be. Change is a word on wheels. It's not a destination, but a journey. If I am to be change, I must commit to humility and refuse to settle for my own comforting achievements. Duro ends his piece with this prayer. That which is in us and all around us, and which constantly draws us to be our holiest selves, remove from me any spirit of complacency that would aim to prevent me from seeing the truth of myself. Strengthen me as I commit to a lifestyle of development, and remind me that lifestyle is simply called love. Amen. Thank you, John. Our next hymn is number 84, How Far Can Reach a Smile. It's a new one. Do your best. The choir will lead you through. But Karen chose this because it was just perfect for this service. I invite you to rise as you are willing and able as we join in singing hymn number 84, How Far Can Reach a Smile.
Each week, we take some time during our morning service together to recognize the joys, the sorrows, the concerns, the celebration that touch not only our lives, but also those within our world. It is a ritual practiced by many Unitarian Universalist uh, communities and congregations. And we light candles to mark these significant moments and events in our lives. For those who, who are with us online, if you wish, you can type in a thought, a prayer, a blessing, a wish that is on your hearts by using the chat icon on your computer. For those of you here in the sanctuary, we have candle stations on either side of the sanctuary. You're welcome to light a candle uh, using a taper and using the glass of water to extinguish your flame. I invite anyone who wishes to do so to come forward to light their candle for whatever's on their hearts or minds this morning. I would like to ask Tanya for to light one more, actually two more candles, if she would, please. This is a candle for all of those who are with us online. We've been reading your thoughts here in the sanctuary. And just know that you are with us. We are glad that you are with us. And I'll ask Tanya to, ask, to light one more candle for all those joys and concerns that are unspoken and for those 
who are yet to find their spiritual home. May we carry these joys, concerns, and moments represented in these tiny lights in our hearts. They express very deeply that we are not alone. Blessed be. For our meditation this morning, Karen has found a reading by Lao Tse, which I'll be reading in a moment. It'll after your message. Wait to be surprised. It will be wonderful. <laughs> Before that, Karen has a message for you. Yes, and I realize with all things spontaneous, we also forgot to do from you, I receive, but we will carry the gratitude in our hearts this week. When I heard that our theme this month was change, uh, which is one of my favorite things, I thought of that Gandhi quote, be the change that you wish to see in the world. And I've always liked that idea, the idea that we can model the change that we want to see, that we have that power, and I would say also the responsibility to model the way of life that we would like to have in the world for ourselves and for everyone and that rather for waiting for some outside force or you know, somebody above us or the magical them or they, we can just start whenever we decide to. And as I was thinking about that, then another Gandhi quote came into my mind, and it was, as human beings, our greatness lies not so much in being able to remake the world as in being able to remake ourselves. And I always think what an amazing and wonderful thing it is to be able to you know, continually polish our growing edges and reinvent ourselves and discover things about ourselves that we didn't know before. And then as I was thinking that, I also thought, oh yeah, change is really hard. It's uncomfortable. It's sometimes awkward and not so much fun. And it's really easier to stick with what we know. So remember when I asked you to you know, move your feet in a different way or change the way that you had your hands folded or put your watch or your ring on a different hand? It probably made you uncomfortable. It probably interrupted your thoughts a little bit. Maybe made you a little bit wiggly. So if we think of how uncomfortable and how hard doing something as simple as that is, <laughs> How do we ever think that we can change our beliefs or a cultural practice or an attitude that's been developed over decades and sometimes centuries? You know, despite Gandhi's optimism, do we really have what it takes? As Daru Farrar said in our reading, I wonder if in our efforts to be the change we wish to see in the world, we stop short at our ideal selves, the idea that we're the most comfortable with. You know, I, he wondered, how often do we think, I've already been the change. Everybody else just needs to catch up. How many times do we need to make mistakes at other people's expense before we admit we're really not so good at this stuff? Well, yes, we all have blind spots and we all have limited self-awareness, but I don't think that's reason enough to stop trying. In fact, I think recognizing those facts is even more reason to keep trying. But it's also what makes it important to know the why of change. The why we want to change provides that motivation that keeps us going when things are uncomfortable and awkward and we're realizing that Maybe we're not quite so good at this stuff as we'd like to be. For me, the why of change is not to become perfect, because that's an impossible goal, or to gain the admiration of others, because that's fleeting, it's external. My why is because I want to be in positive, deeper relationship with other people and with the world around me. I know that when I change the way that I think, it changes the way that I feel, it changes the way that I act, and that actually changes the world around me, both my perception of it and the actual world. And 
you know, on my gray and grumpy days when I'm thinking about how unfair life is and how wronged I've been and how unappreciated I am, I tend to find traffic snarls and frustrating people and signs of incompetence everywhere. But then on those days when I center my thoughts on gratitude and appreciation, my days somehow become filled with examples of generosity and moments that make me smile and meaningful conversations. It's kind of amazing. So for me, the words of our opening reading really resonated. What is it that gives you the power to make that change, to ask that question, to take that journey? It is relationship, the beating heart of our faith. I truly believe that wanting to be in relationship is the how and the why of change, and that love for ourselves and others is the powerful force that makes lasting change possible. One of my very favorite stories about change, I learned at a change leadership course that I was taking, and the, um, it was a vital smarts course, and I'm giving them credit because it's their story and they shared it. Um, but the instructor shared a story about a woman called Mimi Silbert. And Mimi is a 95 pound dynamo who brings peace and joy to the lives of people who have never known it. And before I tell you about Mimi, let me tell you about James. So James was a career criminal and a drug addict. And after four years as a regular runaway criminal and drug addict, he turned 10. By that time, Illinois, where he lived, was fed up with his shenanigans and had tracked down his father, who had abandoned their family at age one, when James was one. And the state justice authorities uh, wished James good luck as they stood with him at the gates at O'Hare Airport and let him know that he was no longer welcome in Chicago. So James flew to Oakland, California, where he took up residence with his father that he had never really known or remembered. And the first lesson his dad sh taught him was how to shoot heroin. And so the next 25 years of James' life consisted of uninterrupted periods of violent crime, drug use, and prison time. And eventually he was convicted after a violent offense and sentenced to 18 years in prison with no hope of parole for 16 years. And that's when he asked to join an organization called Delancey Street that he'd heard about. So James is typical of the people that Mimi Silbert welcomes into her Delancey Street community. It's a residential self-help organization which has really revolutionized thinking about rehabilitation and the possibility of change. Delancey Street residents arrive with an average of 18 felony convictions, seven years in prison and no better than an eighth grade education. Most are illiterate, Few have ever held a skilled job, and more than 85% have been heroin addicts for an average of 10 years, and better than 60% have abused two or more drugs. And they range in age from 18 to 68. They're equally divided between African Americans, Latinos, and Anglos, and one quarter are women. The residents stay at Delancey Street for an average of four years and they soak up education that spans vocational, cultural, social training. But here's the amazing part. There's no staff. The professors are the reformed convicts and drug addicts themselves. The method that Mimi Silbert teaches is each one teach one. Her philosophy is if you read an eighth grade level then you can help somebody who reads at a sixth grade level. She says the hardest thing that we try to do is get rid of the code of the street. That code says care only about yourself and never rat on anyone. She says if you reverse those two beliefs, you can change everything else. And so with that in mind, what she does is requires every person to take responsibility for someone else's success. So each resident is placed in charge of someone else the very first week they arrive. So for instance, say you're a resident who arrives seven days earlier, 
Um, you might have been homeless, you might have been strung out on crack, doesn't matter. During the seven days since you came to Delancey, someone who'd only been there a week before you may have taught you to set the table in the restaurant that they run. So seven days from then, when the newest person comes in, it's your task to teach that person how to set the table in the restaurant. And you are responsible for their success and support. And from that day on, nobody else asks about how you're doing. They ask, how is your crew doing? How are the people you're supporting and responsible for doing? Delancey Street's success is staggering. They have seven locations across the U.S. and they have graduated now over 18,000 people, James being one of them, who's now a manager of a moving company. Over 10,000 formerly illiterate people have received high school equivalency degrees. They've moved over 12,000 violent gang members away from gangs into active nonviolence. Over 8,000 Delancey residents have mentored others teaching nonviolence and interracial mediation. They've successfully developed 20 enterprises completely by formerly unskilled people using the each one teach one philosophy. And they've pooled their resources so that they actually generate about 60% of all their operating funds. That, to my mind, is pretty positive change. And what a difference from change motivated by hate. That happens, but we can see the long-lasting trauma of change motivated by hate. Look at the examples of the Indian Act, residential schools, white supremacy, dictatorships. Sure, those all cause change, but not for the good, not for the better. And the lasting legacy is of trauma, shame, and guilt, not positive, loving relationship. So I was doing some research for this service. I ran across an article called Change Yourself, Change the World, which I thought was a pretty good title, um, by Burju Pandya. And it really captures for me the connection between change and relationship. He wrote, what if real change came not from attacking a global problem directly, but by focusing first on changing ourselves internally? Specifically, I mean cultivating an other orientation as opposed to self-orientation. Cultivating a deep connection to people and the planet as a precursor to any outward activity. He continued with a story. He said, recently a friend of mine tried to do just that with what he called a karma auction. He gave away hundreds of computers via auction, but the way that you bid was not with money, but by sharing how you would use that computer to improve other people's lives. The most impactful plans got the computers. This is a wonderful idea, but to me the most intriguing thing was how each person in the chain must cultivate an other orientation as part of the process. And then that process rewires everyone's brains just a little bit towards humility, empathy, openness, and helpfulness. Each computer must have generated hundreds of similar ripples, all because the intention from the beginning was other oriented. Now if we went at it the other way, focusing on the highest dollar bids, those ripples probably wouldn't have occurred. The big shift that happens when we switch the focus to the internal is we stop working at the level of the symptoms and start working at the root of the problem. It's kind of like the person who loves junk food but is trying to lose weight. And rather than face the deep problem, it's easier just to switch to the low calorie Oreos. The problem is that eventually not facing the root of the problem leads to even more worries, like cancer or heart disease or yo-yo weight gain. In the world of social change, the symptoms are the lack of deep connection, of services, of insecurity, and the lack of love. Addressing that root starts by going within and slowly changing oneself action by action. Whether you're a world leader or an everyday Joe, building that deep connection is tremendous value. Hanja ends his article by noting that it's a bit of a paradox, but in the end, the end result of all this internal change is in fact 
of the greatest service to the world. Imagine a system proposed by someone who deeply cultivated thinking only about others for their whole life. Imagine an incentive system or a business model born of the same process. In a world where everything is mostly self-oriented, these options would be breaths of fresh air. Systems do need changing and incentives do need to be reworked. However, there will be no wisdom to inform societal changes unless we cultivate an other orientation in addition to our daily work. The key is simply to get started. So, let's get started. Personal change, as we've learned from our little examples this morning, can be uncomfortable, but it is possible. And as we heard in our story, it's not only possible, but it's a gift and a responsibility of being Unitarian Universalists. Sometimes changing ourselves means learning something new, but just as often it means unlearning something old or letting go. But the rewards for making those changes, that deeper connection with ourselves, with those around us and our planet, make it worth persevering through the challenges with all that in mind, I'll end by repeating De Roe Farrar's prayer. Remove from me any spirit of complacency that would aim to prevent me from seeing the truth of myself. Strengthen me as I commit to a lifestyle of development and remind me that that lifestyle is simply called love. Amen and blessed be.
don't want to learn this by Elizabeth Nguyen. Spirit, I would really rather not learn this. Didn't think I needed to. I thought someone else could do it. No, a leader was coming to do it. Thought the young people could do it. Or elders could do it. Or the professionals. Or I don't want to learn it because it means letting go of something I hold dear letting go of being someone who knows the answers, letting go of being someone who doesn't know, letting go of the way I see the world, letting go of how I, I might have to change, letting go of certainty, of logic, of facts, of control, of the myth that you can live on this earth and not harm, or the myth that I can't learn anything new. Help me to learn it, please. And then help me to live what I have learned and do right by the gift of being taught. Thank you, Lynn. Well, having attempted to change the order of the service this morning, I have been brought back online by my beloved community. And so we'll take a moment to just settle in and have a moment of meditation, reflection. I have a reading by Lao Tse, which will be followed by a moment of silence. You'll then hear a recording by Dave Rowe singing a song entitled, I Have Decided. We have a little notice on our bulletin board in our hallway at home that says, inhale love, exhale gratitude. So if you wish, let's take a moment, breathe in some love, exhale some gratitude, and another deep breath in of love, and an exhale of gratitude. These words by Lao Tse. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to, to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. Let us enter the silence together.
decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. I have decided. you to go online to YouTube and listen to more of, of Dave's music. Quite lovely, quite inspirational. Our next hymn is number 131, Love Will Guide Us. I invite you to rise as you are willing and able as we join in singing hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. Dave Rowe song that we listened to during meditation is actually in the Soul Matters package that hopefully all of you received through the e-blast this week. And so if you want the link, it's there along with some of his other songs, which are just equally amazing. I would invite Allie to come forward and extinguish our chalice. As she does, I have some words by Emily Richards to share with you. 
And before I do that, I'd also like to thank all the volunteers who made this service possible, especially our tech people who we've thrown off by switching up a few things at the last minute. So thank you for going through the flow and changing with us. Holly, please. May you leave this time together changed. May the promises you have made to yourself about who you want to feel closer to and who you want to be feel closer to the reality of who you are right now. May you share that feeling of transformation wherever you go. And may it spread into every word, deed, thought, and interaction until we are all changed, transformed, and transforming together to become our better selves. We have a postlude for you, and then we will join together to sing Carry the Flame. meeting right now pretty much <laughs> maybe a time to refill coffees and then come on back in sure.